Um, I want to talk about an album that you put out in 2020 called uh, Matt Rawlings Mosaic. Yeah. And, and uh, it's a really neat album. Um, one you. of the things I found most interesting, which will lead you hopefully into a story, is the fact that there is a Lyle Lovett tune on it, but that's not the one Lyle sings. Uh, <laughs> you have yeah. If I Had a Boat and uh, Ramblin' Jack Elliott is the one who sings it. Now, are you sick of telling this story? Because it's pivotal to this record. Uh, no, I'm not. I'll tell the story. Um, yeah. So uh, this this so this whole thing came out of the 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 Allison Krauss tour. Uh, Jay Belarus was the drummer. He and I, you know, had become close and uh, sp spent a bunch of time together. We would eat meals on the days off, and uh, together uh, we'd find you know great restaurants. And and one of the things we did was you know every day there'd be a sound check, and Allison Allison wouldn't come to the set. She, you know she would save her voice, and there was no need for there's no need for her to be at the sound check. The sound check was primarily for the front of house guy just to get a get a sense of what he was doing. But everybody was, you know, everybody but Jay was on in ears. Jay was the one guy with a wedge. Um, but what what started happening is Jay and I would kind of just kind of wander on stage early and and one of us would start playing something. Either I would just start improvising something and he would jump in with his amazingness or he would start a groove and I would start something. And it it they it was really cool. It was really compelling. So he started Putting, because he was the guy with the wedge, he started putting his iPhone next to the wedge and recording these little pieces. And then he'd send them to me. And I started a little file of of uh, of sound check improvs. And they were called like Akron and Cincinnati and, you know, mm -hmm. just named them after the city we're in. So I, I started thinking like, uh, man, it'd be cool to record, you know, like to, to go into the studio and and, you know, record this kind of duo situation that seems to be happening and so that was in the back of my mind so cut to we're on a break from this tour and i'm in northern california um uh and uh where my wife's family all are and so our son is staying with grandma and grandpa and my wife and i get a little airbnb in this town called inverness and inverness is is in marin county and it's it's on uh tamales bay uh, and it's this beautiful little, you know, bayside town. And we got this great Airbnb for like four nights. Tamales Bay feeds into the Pacific up above Point Reyes. And Point Reyes is this, you know, like sort of peninsula that's, that sticks out north of San Francisco. And there's a lighthouse there and there's a Point Reyes National Seashore. So above this, Tamales Bay, which is a little inland from the Pacific, it's like a kind of a finger bay. And so, uh, Point Reyes is, or sorry, uh, Inverness is on the Pacific side, but if you go down to the bottom and then back up again, then you're on Highway 1, and that's the sort of, I guess that would be the east side of Tamales Bay, So, and if you go north, at the very top, there's a little town called Marshall, and then right above Marshall is this little place, it's this little restaurant right on the bay called Nick's Cove, and they've, it's a seafood restaurant. And they've also got a couple of little cabins that you can rent, like you can rent a cabin and have dinner and spend the night, and which we didn't do. But we just for our last night, we made a reservation, drove up to Nick's Cove. And so Nick's has got and so uh, if you right in the middle of the bay, sort of at the same spot as Nick's is this is this island called Hog Island. And it's just this rock in the middle of the bay with a bunch of trees growing. It's a very mystical looking uh, little island. And so we pull up and we're a little early and they and they have a pier and right at next there's a little pier that juts into the bay with a with a boathouse and we just said oh let's let's just walk down the pier and check out the boathouse so we did and it's foggy typical sort of west marin you know fog on the bay and uh and we go in we we walk into the uh oh i think we met somebody outside who said oh you should go into the boathouse or they got a fire going in there so we walked in. The first thing is right on the right at the doorway to the boathouse is an old upright piano, which is fairly random, like it's in a boathouse that there'd be a piano. And my wife, very atypically, I will add, she she hit a note. And how she tells it now is that she she, you know, was are there are there even strings in this piano? It's in a boathouse. So so there were, hit a note, bonk. And there's this old guy sitting, uh, sitting at they have like a picnic table and then they've got a big wood burning stove and it's it's stoked and it's toasty in there there's this old guy sitting there he's got a sketch pad and my wife hit this one note and this old guy said oh you're gonna play something <laughs> just like perked up uh -huh. and my wife says no nah, no that's all i got but i said i'll play you something so i just stood there there's no bench 
And I just started playing, improvising a little sort of ragtime thing, key of F, my kind of go-to, the key of love. <laughs> and, and, uh, and this guy just like, the lights went on and he just started talking and, uh, and telling us these stories. And we looked at his sketchbook and he had driven, he had, he had written, or sorry, drawn uh, like a point of view, like the inside of an old semi double shifter semi. And he said, you know, uh, he said, if I had kept doing that, I wouldn't have to play guitar my whole life. And, <laughs> and I, I had no idea who this guy was, but I played a little more and it was just, it was, he was this like elfin leprechaun of a guy. He was, he had a cowboy shirt and suspenders and looked great. And, uh, and so it ends up, this is Ramblin' Jack Elliott, who lives in Marshall. He'd been there for, I don't know, 30 or 40 years. He'd lived in this little town. And he comes up to Nick's and sits by the fire and sketches, you know, fairly regularly, right? It's just one of the things he does. So so anyway, we spent an hour with, with Jack. And then, uh, you know, he told us about how in his 40s, he like rented a, he, 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 he climbed the Italian Alps on a Vespa, something like that. How, you know, he... Or maybe the he maybe that was earlier, and then in his forties he he learned to ride bulls. Uh -huh. All these stories, all these you know, like he was just like one after another. And um, there's a there's a documentary that his daughter made years ago about him, and it a bunch of people are interviewed, a bunch of icons, and Chris Christopherson is one of them. And I think he says, you know, you know, people, what is it? People think that they call him Ramblin' Jack Elliot because you know, because he's been around. Yeah, but it's really is just because he won't stop talking, you know, it's just, <laughs> right. it's just, and it's all true. Like everything that comes out, it's all true. It's amazing. So we, we finally, we, you know, we, we were able to get a table an hour after our reservation and we sat by the window. There's a photograph on the back of that record that is the view from our window that night of Hog Island out in the Bay. And, um, and we went back to the last night at the Airbnb and I was really struck by this meeting it was like this sort of mystical i felt like we had been to avalon or something i you know i googled jack because i had heard of him but i didn't really know much about ramla jack elliott mm -hmm. and ha i honestly half of me like expected to google him and find that that he had died you know two years ago and like <laughs> this was an apparition or something <laughs> like but nope there he was he had a website and management and and he was currently at that point. He was signed to a, a small indie label in L.A. Which, um, and so I just I had this I had this feeling like I'm supposed to make music with this guy. And as a producer, the first place I took that was like maybe I'm supposed to produce a record on Ramblin' Jack. And uh, so I I had a manager at the time, this guy Jeff Castellas, and I talked to him about it, and we started just sort of plotting and planning, and you know, so a couple of weeks the tour finished, and I was either it was finished or I was on another break. I was back in Nashville and I was a bit obsessed with this. And my wife, bless her heart, as they say in Nashville, she, she came to me one night. She said, Matt, you know, this kind of, we, we, we have a term for this in our marriage. It's called the chase. And the chase is, is when Matt is obsessed about something uh, and is really, you know, trying to make it happen and it's getting a little bit uh less than relaxed maybe <laughs> so she said matt you know this whole ramla jack thing like it's kind of starting to feel like the chase to me and i grumbled and grumbled and you know blah 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 but um she's and this came a hundred percent from her she said i have an idea why don't you make a record and ask ramla jack to sing on it and and it was like the kind of the 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 lights went on like the it was the aha moment and almost immediately after that, I started thinking, well, yeah. And then, God, who else could I ask? Like, maybe I make a whole record like that. I'm sure Lyle could get Lyle to do it. I could get Allison to do it. Willie, you know, I have all these relationships. By the way, two Grammys with Willie Nelson, not just yep, one. Just, right. Just to but correct two, you, Did you get two awards or just two nominations? Yeah, two awards. Three oh. nominations with Willie and two awards. Yeah. Well, sorry, my mistake. Yeah. That's no, all right. Just <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Set the record straight. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but it, you know, it just occurred to me like, wow. And, and then, and then what if we get, you know, Jay, this sort of dovetailed in with, with this idea with Jay Belarus. And so the, so the original idea was, and we recorded all this stuff. The original idea was to have these songs with these artists. And I'll tell you in a second, I'll, I'll circle back to your original notion about uh, the Lyle Lovett song, but yeah. to have all these artists and then 
Jay and I would record improvisations a la our sound checks, and those would be interludes that we would place between the songs, right? Mm -hmm. And so we did that. We recorded all these songs. And, and so we had, my wife was basically the a &R department for this record, and she helped me pick artists and pick songs for the artists. And we, we came up with kind of a, a, a set of rules for the songs, which were number one, um, originals that I wrote. Number two, songs that were previously re released, but that I had been a, a part of, or three, and this was a little bit of a, of a vaguer one, but songs that were just really a part of my musical DNA, right? Like really important songs to me. So, and, and underlying that was the, uh, uh, the artist, we're not going to do, we're not going to have artists do their own songs. Mm. Um, we're just, you know, the whole notion was to, to pick songs that I that I would then reinvent. And so I did a bunch of original arrangements. I think the most stark one is the Spirits in the Material World, which, you know, until you hear the lyric, you maybe don't even know that it's yeah. the song. But um, that's one of my favorite ones. But so, you know, Ramblin' Jack, we knew, you know, I, I kind of went back and forth. Ramblin' Jack had to be a part of this, but we weren't quite sure what the song was. And then when we came upon, and I, it might've been my wife, but we thought of, because the thing about If I Had a Boat is for a lot, when Lyle sang it, Lyle sang this from the perspective of a kid singing about the fact that he had just realized he doesn't have to pick one thing. He can be a cowboy and he can be a boat captain. He can do both of those things, right? Yeah. And it was this sort of, um, you know. That's what makes it wonderful. Yeah. 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 But so for Ramblin' Jack, Ramblin' Jack is a cowboy and he's also a boat captain. Like he is those two things. <laughs> So um, he could really do that. <laughs> so yeah, and 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 he's also he's in his 80s. And so yeah. we we to cut it more slowly and almost make it a bit of a swan song for him. Uh and of course it wasn't, but it, it technically, but I mean to 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 frame it in the way of someone who's done all those things and is maybe in the in the final chapter and to then sing about them, it, the song to me became poignant in a really different way. Yeah. And so, so that was the hope when we picked it and that proved true to, in my opinion. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's, uh, it's a that's wonderful the, story. And yeah. I, I want to talk about a couple more tracks on the record that intrigued sure. me. Um, and yeah. I was so delighted, so delighted that the first track was take me to the Mardi Gras, which, yeah, so that, that falls into the music DNA, what right? that falls into the musical DNA category yeah. that, that rhyme and Simon record is one of my, right. all, I mean, I could singing every song word for word. It's one of my all-time favorite records. Mine Desert too. Island Mine record, too. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and not uh, that's not one of Paul Simon's signature tunes. Very few people know that tune, probably. So yeah, it's an it's no, an interesting it, choice, but it's so beautiful, you know. And so you know, and I had met before the Warren Treaty got their record deal. Before you know, they're completely blowing up now. But I used to play on what they call the medallion ceremony, which is every year they they do they induct three people into the Country Music Hall of Fame. Uh, alive or post posthumously, um, and I uh, they have a house band, and so I'd I'd done a number of them. So the year, the last, I think it might have been the last year I did it. It was right before. It was right actually right as I was making this record, and I saw on the for the rehearsal the day of in the daytime. I saw on the schedule the war and treaty, and I thought, what does that mean? Like, who are these people? We're in there in the rehearsal, and it comes time for them to rehearse, and these two. Uh, Michael and Tanya walk on the stage, and I just knew from the moment I saw both of them, I said, "I want to, I want to be your friends." Like I don't even care. I don't even know what you sound like. I just, you know, Michael. Just there was a, there was a a spirit and an energy emanating off these two people that was palpable, yeah. and Michael had like these sparkling loafers on, and they were just badass without even uttering a note, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then they sang. Um, some it's uh was it Jeannie Seeley who, who forgot somebody's gonna give you this and then leave lesson and leaving somebody's gonna give you back what you've been given and I, whoever the nom whoever the inductee that year was her song they sang that song and just absolutely murdered it and and uh, I knew that they had made a record with um with with Buddy Miller my friend Buddy Miller who also sings on the record so I I reached out to Buddy the next day and I said. Can you connect? Can you hook me up with these people? And I just called. I cold called Michael Trotter, and uh, and he knew about me. And he, you know, obviously we had just done this show together. And I said, "Man, I'm making this record. Would you be on this record?" And uh, I don't know what song yet, but we'll find one. And he agreed right then. And then I found. Then then we came upon. You know, 
I would go through my entire iTunes and all the artists I love and just looking for songs for people. And I came upon this one. Oh, and I went, Oh, what if this, what if the Warren Treaty did this, you know, just sort of like boom and they loved it. And so they came to the set to the session that day and murdered that song. I mean, a hundred percent. Was it new to them or did they know it? What's that? No, no, it was new to them. So they learned it. Yeah. They learned it. And you know, you would never know it because it sounds like they've been singing it their whole lives. But yes, but then, uh, you know, then I, you know, I had this, I'd always loved um, uh, um, Wade in the Water. Um, and my first introduction to Wade in the Water was my first piano influence was Ramsey Lewis. I mean, Ramsey Lewis Trio had a hit with an instrumental version of Wade in the Water. And so I just threw it out. I said, hey, would you guys be interested? Just, I know we didn't talk about it, but would you guys be interested in cutting this one, seeing what happens? And they both knew the song and we printed the lyrics and we just did one or two takes of that. And then that came out. And then, you know, then I went, wound up putting the Blind Boys of Alabama on it. And, you know, it's very organic. We would, all of the tracks on that record were cut with Jay, myself, and the artist. And that's it, live. Jay and I in the same room and then the artists Mm. in the booth. But 90% of all the vocals on the record of the lead vocals were were live. Just what happened, you know, yeah. These days that really does stand out because everything's very produced today to... To successfully do a live track, people don't always know what's happening, but you can feel it. Yeah, yeah. I certainly didn't know what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I mean, I think, yeah, it's. I think that the key to doing that is I have to have a willingness to just let it be what it's going to be, because I can always go back and pick something apart and wish I did it differently. But, you know, it's a captured moment, and, and there's power in that. To me, that recordings like that stay alive. They stay, you know, and you can tell those old Paul Simon records, you know, they're alive. I can listen to them 50 years later and think, man, that thing is as relevant now as it was then, in my yeah. opinion, you know, like and those tracks, from the Dixie cut, Humming you know, sh- harmonizing before. Uh, I love oh, my rock, God. Yeah. Right. right before the oh, song God. Begins. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, um, I'm, yeah. yeah. Well, okay, so talking about innovations, spirits in the material world, let's circle back to that. That is a strange choice. <laughs> uh, for this, it's just be- only because the arrangement you have to make is going to be way far from the original. It's not like the other tunes on the record. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so this guy Charlie Green, who's this guy from LA that I met through our dear friend who's now passed, uh, named Ed Cherney, who was who was a really uh, remarkable and legendary recording engineer. Um, um, and Ed recorded every bit of Mosaic and he died before it got mixed. So he wasn't able to mix it, but um, he introduced me to this guy, Charlie Green. And I wound up producing an EP on Charlie that I, uh, and Charlie is just this really, really interesting and talented. He kind of looks like the Marlboro man and he's this hunky baseball playing guy, but then he writes these really interesting and introspective songs and so we made this record and and so just because we had because i'm such a fan of his i thought man i'd love to find a a place for charlie on this record and and we just couldn't find a song that that felt like and he would come up with songs and nothing that we came up with was like yeah that's not really it so um we're driving my wife and my son and i were driving south on the 101 i think we're headed probably we're driving from Marin County to LA and we're going to stay with our friend Maria in Los Feliz for a couple of days. And uh, we're still living in Nashville, obviously at the time. And we're listening to the radio and that song comes on the police. And, and, and my wife and I both looked at each other and, and went, Charlie, like it just sort of was this sort of, (laughs) and so, The whole way back, I'm writing this arrangement in my head and we get to Maria's house and I come up with this thing. It just was sort of sitting there waiting for me. And I came up with this this arrangement and I played it for Charlie and he was all in. And I remember Jay, I remember Jay Belarus. I I texted him. I said, what about spirits in the material world uh, for for Charlie Green? And (laughs) Jay, bless his heart. He sent me back the green puke emoji. (laughs) And... (laughs) Because I don't know, he's not a police fan, whatever right. it is, you know. Um, <laughs> but then, but then I played him a little, you know, a little voice memo of my take on it, and then, and then he he got it, and then we recorded it, and it's to me, I think it's amazing. It's one of the, you know, uh, one of the coolest tracks on the record, and I wrote a string arrangement for it, and yeah. um, you know, I don't know if Sting's ever heard it, probably not, 
you know, uh, hopefully he'd be okay with it. But I think it's, I think it's great. I think it just shows that the song is so amazing that it, it's, it's very flexible and very, you know, great songs are like that, in my opinion, great songs are very um, forgiving. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting, yeah, to listen to covers and see who's, who's willing to take the song somewhere else that works for them rather than try to recreate what the artist did. I've got a handful of others that uh, if I ever do any more recording like that, I've got I've got a Who song. Which one? Oh, it won't get fooled again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Um, but it's really different. And uh, and then I've got another police song, Canary in the Coal Mine. Oh, that's so great. But I it's would... really so different. And maybe I'll just cut them and sing them myself sometimes. Who knows? Yeah. But uh, but they're really cool arrangements. I just started, you know. Um, I mean, I have a, I sort of an arranger's heart, uh, you know, and so I, I, I really like the process of reimagining, of like discovering what else might be hidden in a song. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, oh, now you've got me curious. I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, Maybe. if um, someone wants to follow in your path, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who would love to be able to do what you've done in your life, what, what yeah. would you advise them? Wow, that's tough. Um. I mean, I think there's a number of things. You know, I will say it's it's a really different music business than it was when I came up in the music business. I mean, it's completely different, really. If, and I, uh, you know, when I came up in Nashville, there was uh, there was a real apprentice apprenticeship system in place. You know, you were able musicians who wanted to be session musicians could start out. You know, there were there was a thriving community of songwriters who all, you know, a lot of them were uh, were had signed publishing deals. You know, there was a whole a whole um, system of writers writing songs and song pluggers playing the songs for producers and artists and artists putting songs on hold and then cutting them. And all of these songs needed to have demos. And so the sort of middle class of session playing at that point was demo playing and it didn't pay as much, but you could do a lot of it. And so that's how they that's that's how young musicians who wanted to be session players would come up. We would get sort of start getting in the loop of writers and then we'd start playing on demos. And then inevitably a demo would get played, uh, you know, for a producer um, who wanted to cut the song on an artist. And they would hear and like, man, I really like that piano part or I really like the guitar part. Like who's playing that? And then maybe they'd hire them to play on that one song on the record. And maybe and so and, you know, that was the apprenticeship that would then lead to you know, being able to to do the master sessions. That doesn't exist now. You know, it it's yeah. there have to be other routes. And I think there are other routes. I'm not sure what they all are because I don't I haven't done them. But um I will say that I think relationships are paramount. Um and so if you're really trying to to enter the business or 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 you know gain opportunity, you have to be willing to go and meet people and go say yes to anything and everything. And, and um, you don't, you know, I have the luxury now of not saying yes to everything. Um, but back then it, it wasn't even a question, you know, if any opportunity came along, you say yes. And in hindsight, it's like so many things happened to me in unexpected ways. So many opportunities came from chance meetings that if, if I hadn't said yes, never would have happened. So I think, I think that's a huge part of it. I also think that in, in, a, being prepared. So whatever you, whatever it is you're trying to do, like do the research, find out what the greats that are doing that now and that have done that in the past, what did they do? Like what is musically, what's the job? There's another, you know, we talked about innovation, uh, mastery, innovation, and service. That's a three. I, 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 a three is a powerful number to me. And one of the threes that I use and that I teach um, it, that's more of a music specific thing is time, feel, and function, right? And I sort of identify that as if 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 you've got those three things together, um, you're go you're going to work. Like you're going to thrive in most situations. There are outliers, you know. You throw somebody in a you know orchestra with a Tchaikovsky symphony, you know, those three things aren't going to necessarily get you through that. But most popular music, so you know, time developing developing your inner metronome, developing good time, feel, finding a way for to get the music in your body and to do all these things we've talked about, connecting with the other musicians, and then function, 
which is what is my job? Like literally, what is my job in this music? Am I a rhythm musician? Am I, do, I, do I get to play fills? Do I play soft? Do I play loud? Like as specific as you can get with what my function is. So, you know, being prepared um, and knowing, like, like not being the guy that wants to rewrite the script, at least not, not when you're first starting out. Like you want to you wanna be the guy that just effortlessly slots in you know, your first time, you'd never worked with these people before, yet you can sit in the chair and nobody's looking at you going, what the hell are you doing? Like, that's the last thing you want, you know? Yeah. Um, as you gain notoriety, as you gain, get successful, as you become someone that people really want for what they do, then the innovation piece can appear more. You can, you can take more chances. You can get a little, you know, picky, whatever it is. But at first, you know, like know what it is, like have respect for the music that you are uh, uh, trying to be a part of, you know? I mean, and I think it is a matter of respect. I think it's a matter of like many have come before me and I, I'm in no position to, to, to uh, uh, you know, to try to rewrite this. What I need to do is learn, like, you know, it's like a, any musician will tell you, like jazz musicians, you have to learn the vocabulary. You have to learn what all the other cats did before you can really find your voice. And I think that's true for any music. So, and and be a nice guy, like that's, nice person, a nice uh, uh, guy, gal, non-binary, <laughs> whatever it is, you know, be a person um, that that is that gets along with other people, sense of humor. So I've worked with Rita Wilson um, on a number of, and Rita who is, uh, a, you know, a film producer, a film actress, um, and, and, a, and a musician, but also is married to Tom Hanks, right? Um, and so I've I've been in contact. I've hung out with Tom a handful of times. And one of the times I played with Rita the first time she played on the Grand Ole Opry, and Tom was there. He's he's it, he's it's brilliant how he supports her musical career. Um, and he comes out and he's her biggest fan. And he was there were a bunch of people backstage at the Opry, and one of them was a friend of mine who was a songwriter but had a young son, not a young but a young adult son who was an actor and who wanted to go into acting. And here he is sitting with Tom Hanks. So he couldn't not ask Tom, like, what advice would you have for the, I mean, like it's a sort of a chance of a lifetime right. to ask this iconic actor, what advice would you have for a young actor? And he said he had, he had three things and I see if I can remember him. One of them was um, be early. Uh, and if you're on time, you're late, yeah. which is, you know, I can be late to anything except work. I'm never late to work. I'm never late to a session. I'm never, you know, um, and not that I'm late to other things, but that's like a hard and fast rule for me. So, so, you know, be early. The second one was, um, know, know your, which is to me the function, but from an actor's perspective, know your part, know your lines. And, you know, he said for him, it's like, the, I want to know my lines. I want to know the other people's lines, right? Like mm -hmm. come prepared. And then the third one was, have an opinion, be willing to like, like have an idea, have a suggestion. Right. Um, so, so those three things, which I, I mean, I completely relate to every bit of that. And that's the, the innovation thing, like in a session, you take the temperature, but I want to be that guy who, if everybody's sitting around scratching their head, I can at least say, well, what about this? How about if we try this and have an idea and not be afraid, you know, and that might, fail it might not be a good idea but nobody's going to care it's an idea and we're going to try it and it might lead to another idea it might open up the door to something else that happens all the time as a producer you know god I, I mean every record i've ever made somebody has had a goofy idea that's then caused somebody else to play something that i've gone oh that let's do that that's the intro it's brilliant and that's become the record so so having an idea is just it's a matter of like create you create energy when you have an idea you push the energy into something that it isn't right and you're able to move the air in the room and get people out of i don't know what to do into hey let's try this right so you know showing up early that's just respect for what for what for what is what you're about to do being prepared again respect and also you know when i do i've done a bunch of these gigs where I'm in a house band for these big tribute shows. I used to, Don was used to hire me all the time to be in these house bands. And I would write charts for every song. And I would make sure that, that I had, that, that I could sit down, even if I completely forgot the song based on my chart, I could play the song. So I was the guy that everybody in the band would come to and say, Hey, you know, can I look at your chart? Can I look at your chart? 
and you know it's always the pianist right that those right. those are the guys that but but that's my version of that of knowing your lines it's like because for me there's no worse feeling than than be you know being unprepared than that spotlight being shown on me that's the last spotlight i want to be shown on me is is the one that says all right you know let's go over this one more time you know so you know that's it again a long answer but yeah, uh no but, i mean uh, uh, you typify that in your work i mean it's clear well thank you thank you yeah um matt rawlings thank you so much for your time and for being willing to just talk and tell your stories it's really fun to talk to you and and it's a Thank pleasure you. to finally meet you after loving your track for so long <laughs> well, thank you so much adam and i just want to do a quick plug sure. which is that i have a record coming out i've got two singles out now but i have a record coming out september 8th okay and it's called uh, the valentine sessions and it's a jazz trio record it's just oh. me david pilch and elizabeth goodfellow live in the studio no headphones uh playing all original songs yeah how can so, we find you please tell our audience how we yeah well them. so you know it's tip it's all it's apple music spotify all the dsps it's digital only and there are two songs out now the new single is called catch the rabbit and it's uh it's a fun it's jazz it's like it's me going back to my roots and seeing <laughs> seeing if any of it means anything yeah. um and, but, you have a website uh, and i'm too. playing you know i'm gonna play a show i'm gonna play the album release at a club in manhattan called the django all right. On September 8th, Friday, September 8th, I'm playing uh, with Trio and Elizabeth Goodfellow, who's this brilliant drummer from New York, uh, sorry, from LA, she's going to come out to play. And then a guy, a different a bit local bass player from New York is going to play. Um, but yeah, so Fantastic. come hear the jazz. Come hear Matt try to play jazz. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you have a website too, correct? Yeah, mattrollings.com. And that has all the info and is, is fairly continually updated. So right. yeah. Well, thank you, Matt. You're welcome, Adam. I appreciate it. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure. Likewise. And we want to always thank you, audience, too. If you like what you're hearing, press the like button. Subscribe to check out these interviews. And if there's someone you would like me to interview, please send them my way. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much.